The accounts in this film are taken from the diary of the late Ben Bailey, boatman of Dill, and are read as they were written at the time. January the 1st, 1949, New Year's Day, terrific gales are raging. The lifeboat takes two days supply of food out to the stormbound collier, the Baron, which is anchored one and a half miles offshore. The storm is blowing so severe that both lightships have strained from their moorings. On Wednesday, January the 25th, we launched the lifeboat at 11 in the morning to go to the aid of the 6,000 tonne Italian tanker Giacomo Matteotti, which is aground in fog one and a quarter miles north-northeast of the South Goodwin lightship. The motorboats Carefree and Why Not followed us out and assisted with kedging. Two Dover harbour board tugs also assisted. The vessel was refloated by 9.15pm. The vessel was bound for Hull with 8,000 tonnes of gas oil and 44 crew aboard. February the 18th to Tuesday March the 1st, severe gales caused extensive flooding. The sea breached the sea wall at the north end and boats were washed across the parade to the other side. During the night, the British steamer Sailscar anchored in dense fog between the North Goodwin and the South Falls Boy. She was run into by the ship Swede Nordic and holed on the port side. She took on so much water that she requested the services of the lifeboat. Ramsgate lifeboat went out but in nil visibility was unable to locate the ship. Her next known location was at 2.45am as she was passing the East Goodwin, still making water and proceeding at four knots for the nearest land. Warmer lifeboat launched at 3.08am to help search for the ship with the Dover tugs Lady Brassey and Lady Duncan joining the search. The next that was known was when the fog eased at about 6.30am. The ship was ashore opposite Warmer Castle, some 250 yards out. Dill Boatman, who had been watching all night, saw the rockets and raced to her assistance. Warmer lifeboat and tugs were notified by radio and soon joined the other boats. Agents from Dover were summoned and salvage work began. Despite repeated pumping, she took on a heavy list to port. Her starboard tanks were flooded to even her up, and by Sunday at high water, tugs towed her off and took her to Dover Harbour for repairs. The warmer lifeboat stood by, returning to shore Sunday evening after 61 hours at sea. July the 7th, 1949. The council adapted a recommendation that a beach plot be let to P. Harris Mayer for operating a speedboat. Letters to the council from Mr. J. R. Thomas, MP, enclosing a letter signed by G. Budd and all the Dill boatmen, and a letter signed by B. Bailey, owner of the motorboat Carefree, the text of which I appointed. Would it be possible for you to see reps of the boatmen, as we would like to bring to your notice the consequences if the proposed speedboat is brought to Dill? As you know, seven or eight boatmen have laid net sums of money in the region of a thousand pounds money which in most cases represents their life savings to provide Deal with one of the finest selections of motorboats around the coast. We have had one previous experience of a speedboat and on that occasion all the other boats laid idle while the speedboat took the money. We have during the last year had our ground rent increased to a very large sum and in our opinion we are in for one of the slackest seasons we have ever known. This coupled with the added competition of the speedboat will make it very difficult to pay current expenses, much less enabling us to have the chance to reimburse ourselves for the original outlay. The committee stated that, in regards to George Budd's letter, no monopoly to run a speedboat had been granted or implied. It was open to anyone. The facts concerning Upton were that in June 1947, he applied for a license to run a speedboat and wanted to know the council's reaction before he actually purchased the boat. The council agreed in principle to operate in a speedboat between King Street and Castle Road and resolved that the tender be invited from local licensed boatmen for the concession. Later, a petition purporting to be signed by 37 boatmen was received, asking the council to reconsider. It was subsequently learnt that Upton did not prepare to proceed with his application and no further action was taken. The committee considered Ben Bailey's temperate letter and appreciated a number of points made on behalf of the boatmen, but they felt there was no public demand for a speedboat, particularly among the younger generation, and observed that no monopoly had been created. The committee stood by their initial decision. A further letter signed by 19 Dill boatmen said that if the speedboat was allowed, they would boycott the more important fishing festivals in the autumn and withdraw their boats from the regatta. 
Councillor Cavill defended the boatman, adding that there will be no crew to man the warmer lifeboat. The boatman's licence wasn't granted, but the boat licence was. Thursday, July the 28th, 1949. The Carefree left Dill Beach at 12 noon to try and meet the Viking ship Hugin as they made a historic visit to Broadstairs, 1,500 years after the first landing. Thanks to good seamanship and timing, they were successful. The Danish boat was sighted 2.5 miles off Ramsgate, a fine sight with red and white striped square sail amidships and filled with a good breeze. The sun was gleaming on the varnished timbers and gilded prow of the stern. 60 feet in length and the gunnels lined with shields and the crew dressed in full regalia of the times, steel helmets and accoutrements of war, brightly covered cloaks. The men were all blonde, bearded and sunburnt. They kept within a few yards of the Danes at all times, even Tommy Upton's galley. August the 26th. This year's regatta was boycotted by the boatmen as promised over the Harris Marge's speedboat affair. During the summer, Harris got round the fact that he hadn't been successful against the boatman. He was offering free rides if the public bought a postcard. However, the council said that under the terms of the beach plot license, he wasn't allowed to sell postcards. Harris countered by offering free rides and said, I believe only if money is taken, the boatman need a license. October the 23rd. The weather started off calm for the Deal Angling Club's boat festival, but by noon the South Combe was hoisted for a predicted gale. The wind freshened quickly, an outcome that the boats, especially the punts, were going to have a tricky time getting ashore. Boats were being tipped up and flung upon the beach by the swells, the occupants being cast out into the surf. Soon there was a huge crowd of 200 to 300 people watching the boatmen, now soaking wet, saving people from the surf. The last punt coming ashore was nearly a tragedy. Ben had towed them to the shore with the carefree after they had dragged anchor for nearly a mile. When they rowed ashore, they were caught by a large breaking sea and spun stern round bell, trapping them under the following sea. Another sea completely engulfed the boat and upturned it. Onlookers waded into their necks to get the occupants to safety. One received artificial respiration before, and rushed, before being rushed to hospital. This letter was sent to Ben Bailey. Dear Sir, as many of the anglers taking part in the sea festival organised by the Dill 1919 Angling Club and on behalf of the Dreadnoughts SAS, I am quite sure on behalf of all sea anglers taking part in the festival and wish to place on record our appreciation of the fine seamanship, skill and courage displayed by the Dill boatmen under difficult circumstances on Sunday last. To these boatmen, the helpers at the winches and all members of the police and public who assisted to run the boats up the beach with only minor casualties, thank you. It was acute discomfort to people who stood at these winches for hours in the pelting rain that our lives depended and their quickness and skill and it would be ungrateful in the extreme if some of us did not try, try to place our thanks on record. As one who has been messing about in boats for the past 50 years and possibly able to appreciate the finer points of seamanship, it is very obvious that the Dill boatmen are still what they have been for many years, the finest in the world. Yours sincerely, Jack Best, Honorary Secretary of the Dreadnoughts SAS. Photos were in the Daily Herald. Sunday the 11th of December 1949. The warmer lifeboat was summoned at 3am from distress rockets fired from a coaster on the back of the sands. It was two hours after high water with a long soft itch under the high water bank. The lifeboat got stuck on launching. She was eventually hauled to sea by the warps that were anchored seaward. Suddenly one of the warps snapped and the lifeboat was knocked broadside by a huge sea. The crew leapt overboard and rove a chain aft to haul her back ashore for another attempt. Some of the crew were up to their necks trying to reeve the chain through. Half an hour later everyone was back aboard and in soaking wet clothes on their way to the last position that the coaster gave half a mile east southeast of the East Goodwin lightship. With a dangerous list and being helpless, they would soon abandon the ship. Her position was found eventually near the Sandetti bank. The first ship to reach the Dutch casualty, the Tornvit, was the Danish ship Cimbria at 3.30 in the morning. The Cimbria reported trying to help by lying to on the weather side. Later, the Cimbria said she had rescued three of the crew of nine and another six were in the sea somewhere. Tornvliet sank at 5.45am 
after lying half up submerged for some time. At breakfast time, an Irish steamer reported two ships' lifeboats upturned with lots of wreckage but no sign of life. All the time, the Dover and warmer lifeboats and two Dover tugs had been searching up and down the banks but found nothing. Warmer lifeboat beached around 10am after a 45 mile search in high seas.